All right, Mark. Yeah. Hello, we're rolling. That was easy. Fantastic. It's an honor, so thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I mentioned that I want to I want to sort of mix up our conversation a little bit. Talk about different things. So The first thing, I love the fact that you started as a musician, right? that you started as a piano player. The, something that occurred to me is that because you said in an interview, I practiced a lot. How was that, that habit of practicing and the routine, how did that apply to the rest of your career? Oh, it's extremely significant. You know, it was a, a great advantage to have been a pianist before I entered the, the theater area because you can't fake playing the piano. You, you, you must practice if you want to be good. And so I, and I loved it anyway. I, I remember how, how I used to look forward to weekly lessons and I used to spend hours every day playing because I loved it. And I had a whole career. I thought I was going to be a musician and actually did. I was a musician for the early part of my life. But then I met Sandy Meisner. And that changed everything. There, there are people who are talented, but they don't have that habit of working hard or that habit of practicing, of practicing. It's not like I got smart about it. There was no fooling around. You want to be good, you better practice. And I, as a result, I began to respect preparation, training, being with the right people. And I spent a lot of time with her. Awful, wonderful people, you know. Teachers, my God, if I, you think about Meisner and Strasberg and Kazan and Bobby Lewis and Wynne Handman, those were my, my, my friends. And they, they, and being a musician where I knew that you can't fake it, so that trained me to, to work hard and, and, and do what was necessary to, to learn the craft. Some people, especially in this industry, people walk, can walk on set and be very attractive. And they think that's all the homework that they need to do. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, it's, you know, if you want to tell the truth and you want to expose, and you're not afraid of exposing yourself, then you, 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 it's easy. You know, but you you need to want to to reveal something honest. What's the point of doing it otherwise? It seems like there was a time when when your ambition was there, and then all of a sudden, the opportunity presented itself. Yeah, I was ve I was very lucky. I um, when I began, you know, I, I would say that music trained me to respect craft because you cannot pretend to be a musician. And I knew that when I was lucky enough to go to the Neighborhood Playhouse School of the Theater, Sandy Meisner was an inspiration for everybody. He was the best teacher of all of them. You know, better than, and I went to Bobby Lewis, I went to Strasburg, Kazan, Sandy, was a musician himself. And so we had something very intimate when we discussed acting. And I learned to be, to respect craft. People love your classes, but your, your, when you were teaching, yeah. when you were teaching, uh, unfortunately, I came after you when you were teaching. Um, well, we could start all over again. <laughs> I'm game. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but people love your classes. Well, obviously, you're a teacher also. What makes you a good teacher? Listen, I, I, love, I love doing it. I love reaching into people and, and helping them to be what they want to be. Helping them to understand the pleasure of acting. Because acting is doing things, 
under imaginary circumstances. That's finally what it is. It's doing things. It's it's pleading with people. It's whatever the, the, the material has. It's always about doing something, embracing somebody, seducing somebody, uh, charming somebody, whatever it is that the the material tells you what the scene is about. It's not about the text. It's about the intentions. There was something wonderful about Sandy because he was, he, he respected people trying to do well. And he, he was a pianist as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that I was a pianist seduced him into be, being a, a, a father figure for me. Right. He was so sensitive and he, he was also deeply psychoanalyzed as Mazel Tov, so was I. Yeah. 20 years in New York, four times a week. 20 years in California, four times a week. Yes, those, are, those were the most important training grounds for me, was Meisner and psychoanalysis. Okay, why did you get psychoanalyzed? <laughs> I was troubled. Yeah? You know, my father was a Wall Street stockbroker, a very successful guy. But uh, when, when I said I wanted to be an actor, he thought I was insane. Uh, so it took a long time for me to seduce him into being supportive. You know, he saw me on Broadway in plays and mm -hmm. he was shocked. Right. And because I enjoyed it. I loved doing it. I loved behaving, which is really what the acting is about. Right. I, I I also loved teaching. I loved helping people to arrive at the places the way where they should be. I think I read that that someone uh, inspired you to become an because you had no intention of being an actor, but someone inspired you to become an actor. Yes, Marilyn and Alan Bergman. Uh, you, you you know who they are. They're, they're great songwriters, and and they they said to me said, I'm taking you over to see Sandy Meisner. I said, what for? I want you to meet him. And I, I, she brought me to the Neighborhood Playhouse, School of the Theater, 54th Street, between 1st and 2nd Avenues. And I sat down with Sandy and he said, you, you play the piano? I said, yes. He said, play for me. So I played. And suddenly he became interested in me. And uh, I must tell you, I enjoyed being a student at the Neighborhood Playhouse. Martha Graham was the dance teacher. It's amazing. I mean, you know, yeah. brilliant people. Yeah. It, was, it was spectacular. So I enrolled in the Neighborhood Playhouse, and my life blossomed like in a garden. So you're taking dance lessons. So yeah. you're oh, yeah. Are you a good dancer? No, I'm not a good dancer. I'm okay. What did what did dance teach you as an actor and as a director? Well, it's interesting that you ask that. What does dance teach you? There was ballet and there was modern dance. Ballet was something entirely different. It had to do with with a certain kind of classical perfection, but it all fed into the fact that you learn that. And it came from music. You learn that it's a, a very significant aspiration to be excellent as a as an artist. Mm -hmm. Many people don't understand that. They think personality is all that's necessary. It's not. It's a craft. Mm -hmm. You it's you have to learn how to do it. You have to learn how to really talk to somebody care about what's going on with, with you when you when you deal with them. And it, it illuminated, when I found out those things, it, it put me on a path that I, 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 I was thrilled every day. I, I couldn't wait to go to the neighborhood playoffs every day and do what I did, learn in acting what I did as a musician, learn to be good, learn to be excellent, practice, 
improvisation, night after night, people would come to my apartment or I'd go to their apartment. We'd go to the school all day long at the neighborhood playhouse and the people who were taught at the playhouse were all brilliant. I, that's how I feel about the studio. That's why, that's, I mean, honestly, it's how I feel about the studio. It's, it's a wonderful yeah. place. And I, yeah. I, I owe it all to starting as a pianist. Mm -hmm. Because that's the first thing you learn when you when you're proud to be a musician. Even without encouragement, this is what blows me away. What's is that? that is that you owe, you owe it all to being a pianist, but if without the encouragement, so you didn't have the encouragement from your family or your parents or your father. My my father, you know, he played a little piano. Uh -huh. My mother was a good pianist. Yeah. So music was in the house, right. and when when they allowed me to have a, a teacher because there was someone in the building mm -hmm. who had a teacher who was, who, and, who was a friend of mine in the Bronx. Right. And it changed my life. Yeah. But sooner or later, there's, without the support, there, sooner or later, you're gonna, you, you have, to f have to identify with whatever that is that's in your body where you go, that's my path. That's where I'm going. So they call it chutzpah, call it naivete, call it whatever. I had no doubt. Once I found, once the door opened to to art as a as a in the theater and in acting and in writing and appreciating literature, right? Uh, I had no choice. I just fell into it automatically. So as a director, you go onto the set. You're young. You're in your twenties, right? So you're in your 20s. Nobody really knows you, I'm assuming. So what did you do as a director, as a person in preparation or when you went onto the set, just to let everybody know that this is my set, that I'm your director? Well, you know, I never, I never quite took that position. I, I, I didn't want them to feel that it wasn't their set and their scene and their something that they do. Between Meisner and a number of very good psychoanalysts who I went to for 20 years in New York, four times a week, really brilliant men, Geyser Roheim, for example, who was a, an analyzant of, of Freud's. He was a partner with Freud, and he was my first analyst. And my God, it opened the world to me. I had no idea uh, uh, how, how, how miraculous it was to, to understand things from that point of view. It was, I was very lucky. I had the one, most wonderful teachers, and S Sandy was very important to me. So when you said that, that, that your world was opened up, what, what was something, do you remember, like, what, like a door that just creaked open that you went, holy cow? It didn't creak open, it swung open. And I was flooded with all the things that I felt intuitively were correct. I, I, I was, it was like finding a profession that you know you were born to do, to be involved in art. I was hired to be on a soap opera called As the World Turns. And I did that, you know, from, you go there at 8.30 in the morning, and you'd rehearse and do a live show from 1.30 to mm -hmm. 2 with good actors. And, you know, suddenly I didn't have to go to my parents for money. And I didn't have to beg them to pay for my psychoanalysis. I paid for it myself. <laughs> I was very, very fortunate of being in, in the hands of really good teachers, good analysts, friendly, loving people who respected me and nurtured me. They are without question responsible for everything that I know. So when you're doing As the World Turns, and was it, was it difficult to make a transition to behind the camera? No, I, oh, I instinctively felt that I belonged in the leadership role. Uh, and the fact that I was that I was under the supervision of guys like Meisner and Strasberg and Klerman and Bobby Lewis and all those wonderful people, 
they trained me to understand how to help people arrive at what I needed to see from them. And uh, it somehow I, I was at home. I, was, I knew it the minute I went to the neighborhood playhouse. And I said, oh my God, what a, what a place. Have you seen through the years the theater, theater change at all? Has it stayed, stayed consistent? Yes, yeah, sure, theater has changed. But, you know, my father used to go to the gym. And when my father went to the gym with Lee J. Cobb, and told Lee J. Cobb that I was a student at the Neighborhood Playhouse. Lee Cobb automatically gave him two tickets to Death of a Salesman, which had just opened. So shocking. I was in the first row because of his, his tickets, Lee Cobb's tickets. And Arthur Kennedy's tears splashed on me right in front of my eye, uh, sitting this far away from him. And I said, oh my God. I, you know, prior to that, I thought acting was talking and in, a, in, a, in a, a sensible way. And, and you realize that acting is having a real experience, not a pretend experience, a real experience that illuminated everything for me. Lee Cobb, was instrumental in uh, you know his performance in Death of a Salesman shook me to my toes. I couldn't believe what I was watching because I you're watching people on the stage doing things and really doing them. Have you ever directed Death of a Salesman? Uh, I did. Yeah. I actually played the part in, a, in at the studio. In, uh, in, in I played. Uh, the part that I so respected Lee J. Cobb for doing. It was really something. That was, a, that, seeing that was, uh, I don't know how to describe it. I had no idea that that's what it's supposed to be about. Somebody living through an experience right in front of your eyes. Tears splashing on me, on the, right in front of me on the stage. I went, holy smoke. So let me ask you about at the studio. So when you went from when you went from East Coast to West Coast, did you stay in in touch with the East Coast studio? Did you was that relationship did that remain? Yes. How did I did, of course I stayed in touch with it with them. It was hard to leave them behind. Uh, they were so instrumental in in uh, helping me to know what I was had to learn, and I I drank it down like I was like somebody gave me a bottle of wine. I just poured it into myself, and every day was a miracle for me. Did you ever think about going back, going back to New York? Oh well, yeah, I did go back to New York. And when? Uh, yeah, I did. It? Well, you know, I. I, I was in a number of plays on Broadway and off Broadway as well. I played for eight and a half months in a play with Tammy Grimes. It was, you know, I was I, I, the theater. I was I was in the theater during the day, uh, during the night, and during and doing the uh, as the world turns during the day. You know, I would re you'd go at eight thirty in the morning, one thirty to two. You do a show live, a live. And, and I had a really good part. I became a regular on the show, and I, I was Rosemary Prince's lover, and it was just fabulous. At 2.30, the show would go on from 1.30 to 2. 2.30 would start rehearsing the next day's show, and in the evening I would go to the theater where I was playing on Broadway. So it was... That's a life. <laughs> it was an incredible life. And I, it, I, I respected so much what happened to me. I was so lucky. You know, I, I grew up in a home where my mother played the piano. My father played the piano. And unfortunately, um, he was threatened by me. My, my mother loved me. My sister loved me. I had a younger sister. He, he was threatened by my pr presence and by the fact that they... 
uh, liked me and admired me and, and focused their attention on me instead of him. And it took a long time in psychoanalysis for me to become free of his dominance. Uh, and because I felt early on that it was, that it, when I was good, I was, I was challenging him. And he, he, he interpreted me, he related to me like I was a competitor, my father. Yeah. But it got me into a psychoanalysis. And that, uh, that also changed my life. Speaking of competition. Yeah, yeah. I look at show business as enormously competitive. It's a very competitive industry. Are you competitive? I guess naturally, but I don't. I don't. I don't feel that it, that that I have to beat somebody. I feel comfortable doing the role that I'm doing. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I don't feel competitive as an actor. Uh, I was always. I was very. Luckily, successful early, and I got jobs right away. And I did it, you know, television shows in New York, Danger, Sidney Lumet, Studio One, uh, Craft Television Theater. In those days, the, the they, they weren't. It wasn't television like it is now, where there are regular characters. Every week was a new a new play by a by a new. A playwright, brilliant playwright, and so we 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 uh, were successful as as actors in those days. It was sure. terrific. I found that that uh, so we're gonna jump jump a little bit. Go ahead, jump, so, jump, jump, jump. <laughs> I can so, jump. So you've done projects that have that have strong music core for the boys, um, the Rose. Yes. Were you aiming for that, or were these scripts just happening? It was natural. You know, if if you if you study music, you you learn about dynamics, you learn about rhythm, you learn about what what happens if you go like that, if you move in your behavior in certain ways, you begin to respect um, what the author intended, because the author is telling you that. This is what your part is about. You're trying to do something. The people that did, you know, you were surrounded by such wonderful family, you know, your creative family very early on. Did you, um, when you were doing future projects, did you go to them first? Like, did you cast within your circle or did you have to look outside of? Like when you were working with... I think I did both. Yeah. I cast within my circle for sure. You cast your friends. It's automatic, you know. They, you know them better. You know their work. Tell me uh, something about you and your brain and your skill set. So when you're doing daytime, your scripts are changing like that that quickly. And since you're a regular, since you have a, you're a regular character, yes, right. um, you're getting you're getting significant um, pages probably an hour or two before you go up, I'm, I'm gathering. No, the day before. Day before, okay. So you get, you, you're getting a new script, plus you're doing a play at night. Um, when and how did you learn your scenes? And I don't know how to tell you. Well, you just, you, you'd go there at 8.30 in the morning, you'd rehearse with the, the people, you, and you'd hold your script. By the time 12 o'clock, You'd been through it five times already, and so when one thirty came and they was they said action, you were ready somehow. You, I never tried to memorize. It automatically came. You know, you do it, and you all of a sudden you know it. What's your like fond memory of like Meisner? If it wasn't for Meisner, I wouldn't have learned this. <laughs> I wonder if that's so. I think he came, I was lucky to get him early. But if I hadn't got, got him, I would have gotten someone else because I was inclined to it. I loved the theater. And I wound up in plays that, that were successful that I ran for eight and a half months. You know, it was fabulous. It was, I, 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 I loved being an actor. 
So as an actor, you're doing a play for eight and a half months. And I've, I've heard this answer, uh, this question answered differently. So this is for you. <laughs> oh, go ahead. So as an actor, you're doing a play for eight and a half months. How do you keep it fresh? Because how do you keep it fresh? It's, because if you know that your acting is doing things, it's doing things under imaginary circumstances, but really doing them. So if you're really pleading with somebody and you know that that's the, the, the intention of that moment, you, 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 you surrender to that idea. Sure. You, make, you, make, you make it matter to you. You make it matter that you do it. So does that excitement, that, the, the excitement that you have, the excitement of this discovery, is that still there? Is that still fresh? Is that? It's still there. I love it. I love it. And uh, I've, I've never lost it. I'm very lucky to have gotten hold of that early and nurtured it. And I owe a lot to that and to psychoanalysis. I had a, a close friend, Sidney Pollack, and we became partners. He was also a teacher at the... Uh, um, the neighborhood playhouse after me. And we became close friends and formed a company uh, called Sanford Productions, named after Sandy Marjana. And uh, the first picture I made as an actor was The Fox, um, a D.H. Lawrence short story, a uh, very erotic uh, short story about a about two women who, who were lovers and a guy enters their life and I played the guy and, it, and he steals one of the women away and the other is killed. And, but the, 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 it's, it's a great, great play. It was a very successful play. We played it for eight and a half months. And it was just fabulous, fabulous. Every night, go to the theater, do that. During the day, be, be in class during the day, go to the theater at night. When you were given the opportunity to direct, do you remember those moments? Sidney Pollack was responsible for that. Sidney Pollack was my partner. And he became an assistant to uh, John Frankenheimer Sorry. on a picture that Frankenheimer was making. Frankenheimer took care of him, okay. taught him. Right, right, got it. And he worked as his assistant and helped him. Right. And then I found the same kind of situation uh, with Harold Klerman. And uh, I was the beneficiary of great teachers. And the fact that I was a musician was taught me the respect for uh, commitment and to, 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 you had to work to right. make, to be good. Right. And you, there's no escape from that. Right. Also being taught dance by Martha Graham was the same thing. She was a superior human being. She was incredibly inspiring. Right. I mean, going to dance class, you know, I was a Jewish kid standing with my, my hand on a bar and all of a sudden doing you know, the things that, oh my God, I, I loved every moment of it. But did you find that, that from, a, from, a, from a, a, a professional standpoint, from a skill set, from a, um, the way that you would move and act and talk, and did you find there was a difference going from medium to medium to medium? Well, you know, you're always in pursuit of the truth. That's finally what you, what's you, you, you're trying to, to create behavior that's honest and true, and that comes from wanting something. Acting is wanting something, wanting to convince somebody of something, wanting to, to seduce somebody, wanting to be, be loved. And, and if you really do that and don't pretend to do it, you learn about what acting really is about.
And I learned that night of seeing Lee J. Cobb in Death of a Salesman, it just blew my fucking mind to see people behaving right in front of my eyes, really behaving, not, not pretending to behave. They, when they got angry, they got angry. Of course, it was Kazan who, who directed it. Since you brought it up, I have to bring up Kazan. Kazan, yeah, yeah. go ahead. So, uh, I mean... He was very helpful to me. I just... I he, was, he, he was great. He somehow... You know, I, first I was with Molly Kazan, his wife. She had the playwrights unit. She was the teacher in the playwrights unit. And uh, I, I got to, to, to understand things through her. Oh. And if, listen, I was the beneficiary of the best teachers. In, there's so many things that go into becoming a good teacher. So do those ingredients still exist today? That struggle, that, that purity, that, or, or I mean, is it possible to find your, to have your great teachers today? Can you? I think so. Yeah. There are people who, 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 whose instinct is to, to, to teach, to help mm -hmm. someone arrive at the truth. And you know who are generous with their insights and uh, and who nurture people who are paternal, you know, very considerate. That not everybody's like that, but I was lucky to have the right people. Right, right. There's something that Lou does. That, that Lou, 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 Lou Antonio, that that he does. Which I love, and I think he got it from Kazan, and and that is is that he loves to take the actor and put his hand on their shoulder and whisper in their ear, and which creates a, a connection, intimacy, intimacy. I have no resistance to it. It depends on every you know your your relationship to each actor is different. Some actors want intimacy. Other actors want to be led. You have to sense what they, what they need. It's different with everybody. Everybody has different needs as an actor. And you have to determine what those needs are and, and nurture them toward the truth. You know, that's, you, want, you want them to be great. You want to hook into, you want, to, you want the actor to be able to hook into something that's excites, that excites him. You know, I, I loved the studio in New York. Kazan brought me into the studio in New York, and Molly Kazan, his wife. And uh, it was like, you know, I graduated the Neighborhood Playhouse, and within a year I was in the actor's studio, and it was everything. Kim Stanley, everybody was there. Everybody who I worshipped as an actor was there. And it was a very nutritious environment. Who do you like in today's, today's directors, today's guy, the guys who have been working over the cat past couple of years? I like Spielberg. <laughs> he seems to know what he's doing. <laughs> I, I must have been in my 30s, mid 30s or something, but we, we became close friends and he, uh, he was very good with me and we had a good time. He liked my pictures. But I sure thought he was a miracle guy. I mean, my God, he never made a mistake. You always hear, oh, money. We've got to get the money for it. We've got to get the money for it. Was that always the issue? Yeah, but I was always able to do that. I don't know if I could do that anymore. You know, I, I was always able to convince people that this is going to be a sensational picture. You know, David Beagleman was my... He was my agent with Freddie Field before he became uh, the head of the studio, and I was lucky to have them. They really nurtured me and got me going, and I was very lucky. I, you know, I had Steve McQueen was the biggest star that you could find in those days, and I came to California. 
I had done the Fox, which created a big stir. And I ran into McQueen. He said, Mark, great, great. He was doing Wanted Dead or Alive. You remember that TV series? You know, he, he graduated the Naywood Playhouse. A week after he was in California, he was the star of a TV series that was a hit. He says, can you ride? I said, what do you mean, ride what? He said, ride a horse? I said, no. He said, I'll, I'll take you out this weekend and, we'll, we'll, to, and I'll teach you how to ride. Okay. Oh. He took me to someplace in Burbank, we got on the horses and he, you know, he, he, I ran around in a circle in a, in a, in a, in a ring. And then he says, when you, when you go to, they're going to call you. I'm going to tell them to call you. They're going to ask you if you could ride. You say yes. <laughs> so the first thing he asked me, can you ride a horse? I said, like the wind. And then they give me the script, I get the job, and I see that it's a chase, 30 pages of chase, Steve McQueen and me chasing. I said, Steve, how the fuck, I don't know how to do that. Don't worry, don't worry. And we go the first day and they take me in a bus with him out to a location and they point to a mountain and they say, this is a scene where you're racing down the mountain and he comes up to you and says, he's chasing, you, you're you chasing him, but you don't realize that he's the villain and he, you, you're you with him. And but you, you have to be running down the mountain. You can ride, right? I said, like the wind, you know. Now they give me the horse, a big fucking horse. I never... The closest I'd been to a horse was to a theater cop in New York where the police, were, we used to ride horses in, in the theater district. And we start to climb this mountain to do the shot. I said, Steve, how do, I don't know how to do this. He says, keep your knees down. And, and you know, I don't know, he said a few things. He says, don't worry, you start and then I'll come by and uh, it'll be okay. And she said, keep your knees down or whatever couple of dumb things he said to me. And I'm on this horse and they say, action. And I, I kicked the, like a schmuck, I kicked the horse. <laughs> Cause I know that that's what, you, that's how you start a horse. You kick him and I had things on, what do you call it on? The, spurs. On the, spurs, yeah. <laughs> so I kicked it, boom. So we're racing down this mountain, and I'm 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 in a total panic. I have no idea what's going to happen over boulders and everything. And he yells, he's as he's supposed to, stop, stop. So he says, when when I yell, stop, just put your heels down and hold the reins. So I did that. And he comes, he comes up next to me and we have dialogue now. And he says his first line of dialogue and I said, <laughs> And then I finally made the, the, the Reavers with him. Did any man ever inherit a more ill-assorted pair? Well, what was he doing out joyriding in my car? Your car, Boone? Well, uh, the family car. I love the fact that you're talking about wanting in truth. Is there something that you do or experience that you have that to bring people back to that truth? You make me, you remind me of a picture that I made. I made a picture called On Golden Pond. And suddenly I was confronted. Jane Fonda came to me. She, she bought the play. She, she hadn't spoken to her father. Her father had not spoken to her for years because of her, her political uh, uh, aggressiveness on the left. Uh, 
and he was a conservative, and they had no, almost no relationship. She was desperate to connect with him. She, she bought the play on Golden Pond because it was about a, a father and a daughter, essentially. And she went to her father, asked him if he would, if he would be in the play that she would. And for, fortunately, she said, who, who would you like to direct? And he said, Mark, which was a shock, but a, because I had never worked with him before. But somehow he knew my work and uh, he'd seen the Reavers and he'd seen the, he'd seen the Cowboys and, uh, and he, he asked her to go to me. And I was so excited to get that offer. So you're seeing, while you're shooting, you're seeing this cathartic moment. Every day. Every day. Every day. Off camera. How did it begin and how did it end between those two? They, they, they married in a sense. They, re, they reconstructed their relationship. Why did, why did she want to be so public in her, in her reconciliation with her dad? She, well, she was hungry for him. She was hungry for him. He, he shut her out. He hated her politics. But, you know, t here I was with Jane saying, he wants you to do it. I want you to do it. Will you do it? And I read it and I said, I'd be glad to do it. And I said, let's go get Catherine Hepburn. And she went, oh. And so I, I flew to um, Westport where she lived. I sent her the play. I was so intimidated, Catherine fucking Hepburn, my God. It was so exciting to be sitting down with her. And she just was fabulous. She surrendered immediately. She loved getting in the, the, that part. She loved the idea of doing it with Henry. She, she, it was just, that whole experience was incomparable to see the two of them and Jane together, the way that we did in New Hampshire, on a, on a, on a, we found a, a, a house on the lake that belonged to a, a, a doctor who, who uh, worked in Mount Sinai Hospital. And in order to get the house, I said to him, we'll build a second story on your house if you like. He said, will you? And he gave us the house. Now here's this, Incredible house, which we then literally brought in an architect, built a second story on the house with a bedroom and all that, and bathrooms and all that. You know, we spent quite a bit of money to to get that location and that house. And the three of us, four actually, with Dabney Coleman, spent a summer that was it's hard to hard to even describe. Every day was exciting. Every day was a thrill. And Jane and Catherine Hepburn, that was really, because Jane was at that time a very big star. And Catherine, of course, had, was a star in the past. But they, they were like this to start. But by the time they did a few scenes together, they fell into each other's arms. It was so great to see that really happen, to see Jane get it, win her father back, which was very much in the play. And she, she, it, that was the real situation in life. She, she seduced him into uh, loving her again, and they were so close. My concern when I started was how am I going to get their respect? They don't know who the fuck I am. You're a young actor or you're a young director and you see people who are, who are legendary and you see they earned it. 
Oh my God, it was, I, I can't tell you what an experience that was. That summer is as memorable as anything I have ever experienced. Every day was a delight. I couldn't wait to get to the set every day to see what would happen between those two. And with Jane, it was very moving because it was real. Catherine Hepburn said to me one day, she had a line, you're my knight in shining armor. She said to Henry, on a, in a, in a, uh, they were sitting next to each other outside. And she said, I don't know how to do that. Mark, help me. I said, uh, lean over and whisper it in his ear and give him a kiss. And she, went, and she did it, and of course it was a fabulous moment. He, he started to cry. You're my knight in shining armor. You know, what a, it's, it's hard for me to take credit for them because they were already great to start with. All I had to do was encourage them. They did it all. And she, and she made up with her father during the picture because that's what made the picture work because she was so hungry for his approval and for his love. And it happened during the picture. But I tell you, it was, it was an absolutely, the most creative three months of my life existed in New Hampshire with those people. They were, they were brilliant. Every moment was brilliant. And I got the credit for it. From the beginning of this conversation, when you said, you said Catherine fucking Hepburn, like, holy shit, was she? Oh, she was a miracle, a miracle. Absolutely, you knew immediately what had, you know, she was a star from the opening bell. She was incredibly sensitive and giving and, I, 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 I've had a lot of, I made a lot of pictures. I think 13. I never had an experience like that, which was electrifying every fucking day. Every day was a miracle. And they were so thrilled to find each other. You know, I introduced them. Henry, this is Catherine Hepburn. Catherine, this is Henry Fonda. They had never met. Oh my God, I'm, I'm getting chills remembering how incredible that was. Every day when we went to the set, it was another experience for the day that really happened. It wasn't, somehow it wasn't acting. It was really happening. More so than any picture I ever made. So the accolades, I mean, when on Golden Pond is- Yeah, it was really, it was well received. Well received. Yeah, it was, and I was very proud of it. You know, I, when I said to Jane, how the fuck am I gonna talk to them? How, how do they know what, how am I gonna make them understand that I'm, I'm gonna help them, that they need my help? Which was already an arrogant position to even think of, you know? That they should need me, and they did. You knew why they had become the stars that they were. You know, she hadn't worked in years, but she swallowed that part whole. I'm gonna put on my wall, Henry fucking Fonda. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I saw him on, in the theater in New York. He was a great actor. He was really incredible and close to the vest. Never pushed at all, you know, just it happened. Everything happened for him. So that's a, that's a, I don't know whether it's a talent or it's a, an instinct, but he never was false. He just couldn't be false. Last 
trying to hold on to what he needs. I had, I had seen her in a nightclub in New York on 56th Street, a small club, couldn't have been bigger than this room, with tables and a, and, and, and a pianist up there, and she came out. Bette Midler. So I said to the studio, I have the perfect person for the part. They wanted a star, you know. I said, I, I'm, you, I, I sent them to New York to go to a nightclub to watch her because I don't know how to describe her, her talent, but it was something I'd never seen before. Uh, I've seen good actors, but she was not a just a good actor. She was, she was so alive, and and she surrendered. She just surrendered to me. It was so fabulous. She saw that I was crazy for her. She knew immediately that that I really. How many times do you find somebody and you say, "That's not just good." That's great. Yeah. There, there was a sense of life and of, of hunger in her. The studio said, what are you doing? Who the fuck is Bette Midler? They cut my salary in half <laughs> for the first couple of weeks, and then they gave me the salary back. <laughs> she was unafraid of exposing herself and it was uh, I got credit for it I, she did it I didn't do it but I got credit for it they thought I was a great director because she was great she was spectacular no I don't want to get into this but I was actually in for the boys get away <laughs> true story true story oh you're kidding I played James Conn's photographer in London so but that's another story. Oh my God. Oh <laughs> my God. As a matter of fact, I remember, this was wild. I remember, this is 1990. So I had been only been in LA for a couple of years. And uh, I remember auditioning for you. And it was just a, walking into a room. And you were sitting behind a table with a bunch of other people. And you, whatever it is. And you said to me, you should work. That was it. That was it. That was it. And I did two weeks. Two what weeks. A, what an experience that, that was. was brilliant. Really it was. It was amazing. I it was. It was, a, was, it was amazing. Magic. And Every day was magic. Being on stage in Van Nuys when the war broke out, there were four or five hundred people in that. If you remember, in that stage, and the first Gulf War broke out. The first what? The first Gulf War. Yes, oh yeah. You came out on stage and you said, we're in war. That, that's how we learned that we went to war. It was from you. And our, our extras were all Marines, remember? And we started losing our extras because they were being called up to service. Oh my God. Oh, how incredible. Isn't that wild? And you're interviewing me now. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. <laughs> that was great. That was great. Life is strange. Life is strange. from the convent, Life. the wonderful Miss Dixie Leonard. Well, hi. <laughs> Are you trying to get into my flax suit, honey? I'm just trying to debrief you. I want some hugging and some squeezing and some hugging and some teasing and some stuff like that. I like dealing with powerful issues. I like that best. I don't know why I like it. Best. Well, do you feel that um, the the stories that it has to have a, a lesson in that that it has to have a a theme that the the audience is going to walk out and have learned something or it, it helps. It helps if you have that in mind. You want to tell the truth. That's really, you, you approach the material, you, you analyze the material, you select the right actors for it, and then you try to tell the truth. You try to help them tell the truth. And that was, uh, it was a, both a challenge and a, a delight. I love doing it. Do you think about the audience? About what? The audience. 
I guess you automatically think about the audience. You try to please yourself and hope that what you like is what they're going to like. You want you want the actor to be pleased as well, you know. If if you're pleased and the actors are pleased, they're going to be pleased. I think that's for sure. Oh, Johnny. When it brings me up. You have a way about you. I love you, Maggie. I swear to God, I do. Cinderella Liberty, an unexpected love story. Listen, I love actors. I love working with actors. I love. I, 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 I don't know why I love it, but I loved it. It's, 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 it's a paternal role, and I like being a father. And I liked, even, even with people like Henry Fonda and Catherine Hepburn, they needed help. There's no question about the fact that I still get excited about uh, art achieving the truth somehow in a in a relationship or uh, a, a scene where you, you you read the material, you know, you know, I've worked with the writer and I know that deep things have to happen. And uh, the fact that I had been in analysis helped me to, to reach for the truth with the actors in a way that perhaps they hadn't experienced before. I don't know if, I don't want to give myself, to, I don't, I'm not, not trying to give myself credit. I just love seeing somebody happen. That's what it is. You want, you want to turn people on. That's so that there's behavior to watch. Because it's not about dialogue. It's about behavior. You know, I knew James Dean in New York at this at the studio. I, I I acted with him on on in Sunday afternoon. There was a show on television where they it was on for like three hours and on Sunday afternoon, and they'd have a symphony orchestra. They'd uh, they have a, a a a performer a singer. And they, they did a play. This was, what, what the hell was it called? Sunday afternoon from like two to five. And uh, that's when I met Jimmy Dean. We were in a play together. <laughs> he had a, he had, a, we were in a, in a, Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy owned a, uh, uh, um, a drugstore, and Jimmy and I were buddies in the drugstore, and he had a bottle of booze. This was the play, right? And he would he would sip from the from the booze, and Hume Cronin was says, "What do you got there, kid?" Hume Cronin had to come over and say, "Give me that bottle." And he would have, in rehearsal, he would give him the bottle and say, I'm sorry. Now it's live. We're doing it on air. What do you got there, kid? Give me that bottle. Jimmy says, try and get it. Hume Cronin, like the, the, the steam came out of his ears. Try and get it, he said to Hume Cronin. Hume Cronin says, try and get it? He grabbed him by the throat, <laughs> took the bottle from him. But it was a moment, it was a spectacular moment. Where'd you get that bottle? Bronco Evans, you're 17 years old. You can't drink that hooch in my bar. I have my license taken away before sundown. Now, Howie, lay off. I'm not hurting anybody. Any of the rest of you kids been drinking? Mm -hmm. Come on, now, tell me the truth. No, 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 just to step out of the way? Yeah, of course. If you can light the fire and stand back and let them, let them burn, I mean, that's what you should be doing. You have to turn them on. You have to, you have to communicate 
to Henry Fonda and Catherine Hepburn what the scene is about, what they really want from one another in a way that say, oh, oh okay, you know, and then they, they, they do it. I mean, they were, they never made a mistake. They never once made a mistake. Somehow, the, 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 the luck was with me. I, the first picture I made was a big hit. And suddenly everybody was after me, you know. There was, it was, uh, I achieved success very early on. I was very lucky. And it comforted me because I, uh, I felt that I had earned it, you know, in an odd way. You know, being, being a pianist, I knew what craft was about. I knew how you had to work hard to understand. And uh, psychoanalysis was very helpful in working with actors to understand what really moves people, what they're in trouble with, Pick, to be able to sense where they needed an, a little nurturing. So I was good at what I did. I was lucky. I was successful. Do you think there's still um, the amount of truth that you discovered when you were young? Do you think that truth still exists with, with contemporary storytelling? It better. There's, not, there's nothing worth, worth doing if it's not the truth. You don't want to lie. You want to tell the truth. You want to reveal the vulnerability of human beings and you want to respect them and you want them to relate in a deep way. And if, you, if, you're, if you're smart enough to encourage intimacy, you get something good on a screen. I, uh, that's the truth. You want to know why I came back so fast? I got the end of our lane. I couldn't remember where the old town road was. One little way in the woods, there was nothing familiar, not one damn tree. It scared me half to death. That's why I came running back here to you, see your pretty face. I could feel safe, I was still me. After lunch, after we've covered up all those silly strawberries, we'll take ourselves to the old town road. We've been there a thousand times, darling. A thousand. And you'll remember it all. Listen to me, Nestor. You're my knight in shining armor. You're gonna get back on that horse, and I'm gonna be right behind you, holding on tight, and away we're gonna go, go, go. I don't like horses. <laughs> you are a pretty old dame, aren't you? Oh. What are you doing with a daddy or some bitch like me? I haven't the vaguest idea. 